So when we set up this company, it was like the Open Journal System software and re-architected it to make it stable and, and scalable, but we did it at very low cost. We used one developer over a period of a year. So we saved quite a lot of money, and that, and that helps us to be lower cost. Um, and we also we take a very uh, comprehensive approach. We don't just publish books and journals. We also try to publish things like data, software, we publish wetware, hardware, all types, any type of research output that, that a researcher should be disseminating to the research community um, and should get credit for, we try to, to publish those things as well. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about why um, I had to redact the slide a little bit because there were lots of, uh, lots of swear words on it. Um, I know people are sensitive. Um, this is a little bit about why we, we publish and, and why we, we publish data. So obviously scientists have their own competitive natures and their own culture. <laughs> Um, and sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's not always super civil, anyone here is a researcher. Um, but really this is about the social contract of science. And this is something I heard um, Todd Vision from Dryad speaking about um, several years ago. And it really made sense to me that the reason we publish and the reason we release our, our, um, our outputs in, in science and research in general is it, it's, it's critical. It's, it's part of the agreement we have with the rest of the science community that we will disseminate our results will allow people to validate our research and will allow them to build on it and produce you know, advanced science uh, as quickly as possible. It's really crystal and something that Jeffrey Bolton from the Royal Society in the UK said is really that if you don't do these things with a scientific malpractice, you're not following the rules of the community and you're not um, allowing science to, uh, to advance as well as it could for the benefit of society. And that applies to not just your research results, it's also your, your data, your software, your hardware, your wherever, everything you use to do that um, research and to make that research validatable and, and re re reproducible is critical. So um, that's why we think data publication should be an integral part of, of everything a publisher does as well. Um, and so when we talk to our, um, our authors and, and universities we work with, we try and really put across the fact that there are lots and lots of benefits to data publication, and if we're going to make a business that's going to work properly, we have to address the, uh, the researchers' needs and what they need to motivate them to, to take part in data publication. So, but all the, the, the sort of the, the, the very um, researcher-centric things, like the fact that if you, if you do publish your data, you'll get a lot more citations both for the data and for the associated research material. That results in a lot of career recognition. It results in a lot more collaborations as other people get hold of the data and work with it as well. So we have to try and build a system to be successful that motivates researchers uh, in this way. And we also have to make sure that it's in, in order for them to be in the maximum benefit to the research community, we have to make sure that everything is available for research, um, for reuse and teaching, um, that it, it's possible to discover the data sets and, and other outputs in such a way that they can be mashed up across disciplines to enable new types of research to be done, etc. Um, and very, very important from funders and government point of view that everything is available to increase public trust in science, uh, more validation of research, um, and a lot of uh, economic benefits to the research sector. So when we started the company, one thing we did is we made sure we were 100% open access. So we don't have non-commercial licenses, for example, which restrict access um, by the commercial sector, because that's not in the interest of society or the taxpayer. Um, so what we've come to then is a, a model which, where we try to deliver all of those benefits, which we think then incentivizes the researchers as best possible. And the most important thing to, to get data publication work is there has to be as low barrier as possible. So we have very low ABC, uh, the process is charge only $40. I'll sort of explain how we get to that number. Um, and that's really critical because we really believe that too much money is wasted on publishing. Um, too much money that comes into the research system, into the library system, is just thrown away on subscription deals. And it's, 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 a, it's a waste of money that should be going towards improving science, um, improving the benefits to society. So we, we have to keep things as low cost as possible. Um, we make sure the data papers and the data journals we have are very, very short. So that it's very low barrier, people can produce them very quickly. Uh, we make sure the peer review of those papers is very quick and objective. <coughs> and we use an online authoring tool, um, which makes, keeps the cost down because everything goes straight to XML, for example. We don't have to have typesetting services. Uh, it also encourages the papers to be shorter, because we can give them as 
small amount of screen space to write them. Um, even if you tell an author that they should write a one-page paper, they will still give you a ten-page paper, which is bizarre. Um, everything's fully open access. And the critical thing for us in order to keep the cost down and to do a really good job is that we, as the publisher, we're not a repository. So we work with repositories all around the world, but we don't want to be a data repository. We don't want to hold data, we don't want to curate it. That's, it's a hard job, it's an expensive job, and there are much, much more specialized um, resources out there for doing that. But we do, uh, actually, I'll come back. Um, but, um, so that, that's, that's the model we have. Um, and this is the, the standard data processing charge we have for our regular research articles, so it's about $400. Um, and what we try to do is we try to be very transparent. So part of the business model is, is building trust with the research community, with funders, with institutions that, that we're not wasting money uh, when we do things. So we show our, our type saving costs all being done offshore, for example, in exactly how much they cost. Um, we have in the stock we use to support the journals, our software development, me standing here with the megaphone telling you about us our actual business costs, etc. So the only thing we charge as a company is the article processing charge, which is, is important. So we try to make sure that people are only paying for what we do and that it's, it's very clear and transparent. When we do a, a producer data article, we try to make it even lower cost because the barriers need to be even lower. So we, we don't do some of those things. For example, we don't, we don't have typesetting anymore because everything's done automatically. Um, we don't at all take some of our business costs out of that because we don't think this is a core part of our business. We can do that with the research articles. Um, we don't have waiver premiums to pay for people who can't, can't pay, for example, because the cost is already so low. And we end up with, with a price of about $40 because these papers are so small and so quick to produce and we're looking at a volume of business to make this sustainable. But at the end of the day, it is a sustainable business model. And then, basically, we, we work with a large number of repositories around the world, and one of the reasons we don't want to be a repository is we deal a lot with long-tail data. So we're not, it's not, there are a lot of big, um, big data data sets that are coming into the, um, the journals we run, but a lot of it's long-tail. It's just disciplines like mine and archaeology, etc., where it's just a huge range of different data formats and very small data sets often from individual researchers. And they could be held in institutional repositories, uh, national ones, they could be more suited to a, a very specific subject repository, or they may just be somewhere more, more general. So we have a large range of repositories we work with, um, including for software. Um, what we try to link to all these places and provide a, a way to discover things that are in all these siloed locations spread around the world. Um, and this is how, how the system works. Um, so we have the repositories which hold all different types of research outputs, such as software, data, sometimes it's just wetware like tissue samples, mosquitoes, genetic material, that kind of thing. And then we produce what we call a meta journal. And in this case, we're going to talk about data journals, really. And basically, each of the, you've all seen this sort of model before, each of the objects has a DOI or a similar identifier and they, they link to each other. Uh, and the reason we use the, the meta journal is because we think researchers are familiar with publication. Um, papers are their currency. These, these are things they see value in. Um, so they know that by producing a paper, they will receive uh, academic recognition for what they've done. Um, at the same time, they also know um, exactly how to, to cite papers. So that they'll, they'll cite them in their research articles, and they'll, they'll be properly included. They'll put them into the reference list. So there's a lot of talk about how to get data citation to work properly and how to, how to cite with data cite DOIs and things. The problem is people often don't put things in the reference list, they put them in the acknowledgments or the abstract or places like that and they get stripped out by publishers. So um, we did a, wrote an article on the importance of using DOIs with a major publisher about two years ago and they stripped out all the DOIs. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we complained about three times about it and they still left them stripped out. So you can imagine what happens to data citations, and then who, who can find the data citations? How can an index find them and that starts to figure out whether the data is if you're using machine uh, reading techniques? So researchers know how to write papers, they know why they're important, and they know how to cite them. You can also cite them in books, of course. And because we're then using a crossword DOI, which is, is important um, because it's designed for publications, we can also then collect citation information. We can collect old metrics about how much something is being, how much impact it's having in the wider community. Um, and that's really critical. Um, so 
But the other point is that the, the person who writes this paper is probably going to be a data scientist. They're probably not the person who was the, the, not the lead author on the research paper. Yeah, it's going to be someone else who's getting the main credit. Or they may be a, a research software engineer. And for example, in the UK, software engineers have a really hard time getting credit in their institutions for the fact that they're doing actually serious academic work. They're producing very, very complicated algorithms, but they don't get much recognition for them. So but by being able to author papers as first author, they get a lot more um, parity. And very quickly, that the peer review is, is critical, but it's also very quick and objective. So we, we check the paper uh, contents, we make sure that they're accurate, we make sure that everything's correctly described. And very important is the, the reuse section, where it's really a, a way for the person to sell the data and explain to other people why they should reuse it. Uh, maybe in other disciplines, uh, how they could recombine it with other types of data. So it's really trying to drive reuse as much as possible. And then the actual data itself, um, so the person here reviewing the paper goes off to the repository and checks. Um, is it a proper repository? Does it have a long-term sustainability model? Uh, is it well-funded? Have they used an open license for the data? So we're trying to encourage best practice as well. So by being rewarded with the paper, the, the person should also be following best practice. They should be um, doing things in the right way. Um, if, if access um, can't be given with an open license, for example, it's medical data which um, can't be depersonalized, then as long as the access criteria are, are met, then the access must be given, for example. So they can't just be emailed me and I'll get around to it one day. Um, and then things like the version must be open and non proprietary. It should be labeled and use proper uh, vocabularies and so forth in the community standard. And if, if it requires software to make sense of the data so that it's, it's actionable, that must be included as well. So once those criteria are met, the person then receives the paper and they can start throwing their citations and, and their and gain credit. And this is this is an example of one um, journal we have um, in open health data. And it's just, just a, a quick example of how it looks just like a regular paper, because it is. Um, it's, it's gaining a lot of social media activity. We're tracking a lot of the, the normal things like citations, views, downloads, old metrics about where it's being discussed, etc. So in a way, we're, we're able to start, through the proxy of the paper, we're talking about the impact of the, paper, of the data itself. And that that's becomes very useful. And we have a range of other um, journals as well in other areas where there's a community need for open data. Um, so example, a good example is um, in psychology where we had um, the Diedrich Stapel uh, debacle, where he basically <laughs> falsified his data for I goodness knows how many years, 10, 20 years, and there have been 75 odd paper attractions as a result of that, and numerous careers ruined. And so we ended up starting a, a, a psychology data journal there, we have them in archaeology, um, and other fields as well. And the aim eventually is that people will be able to search across all of these data journals and start identifying data from different disciplines that they can mash up and start doing more interdisciplinary interesting research with. And this then ties in with our main business model, which is to power university presses. So we work with universities to have their own publishing platform, and we give them basically the entire basement level back office side of the press. So we run the infrastructure, um, provide the sort of support, all the um, typesetting, etc., and indexing and archiving side of it. And they really run the front office where they source material, work with research, uh, researchers, doing what librarians do best, just giving advice to researchers and providing an interface. Um, and so we, we essentially de risk the business for the university um, by actually writing most of it ourselves. And they don't have to set up their own company, they don't have to uh, develop their own stuff publishing platform, all that kind of thing. And we, we push everything into the institutional repository automatically. And we give them the, the ability to run their own uh, meta journal for, for the university so they can publish all of the university's data and software, etc., in their own publication. And so it's a way of incentivizing staff at the university to make their data um, more publicly available. Um, and then what we do is we, we network all of those university presses up together. And the aim being, so that, you know, this could be um, UCL in London, this could be in Shanghai, this could be Sydney. For example, all of these universities together having their own data publications, sharing a pool of peer reviewers um, and data reviewers, so we're building a data review community, um, so that things can be done very quickly and, and so forth. Um, but then also the uncertain across <coughs> all of the data publications, all of those journals from the different institutions, and have even more discoverability. 
Um, and then we can do other things like we can cascade content through that system as well. And that's basically all pulled on the only cost of the data in that system is the $40 article processing charge, which is being levied every single time the data paper goes through. And that, that's enough to make it sustainable and profitable. And so that's the overview, really. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now or contact me at the email address. We actually have uh, quite some time for questions, so I'll open up the floor. Hi, uh, Sean Sen from Oregon State University. Can you speak to working with uh, societies, professional societies, scholarly society, publishers, in terms of getting them to think in terms of open access to their journals? Because that seems to be an area that's really right for some progress to get them to think outside of just working on a subscription based model. Uh, for profit publishers to the distribution. It looks like a couple of your times one of those kinds of societies. Yeah, so we still see societies as small universities sometimes, so some of them have maybe 25 journals even sort of size. So it's, it's very much similar to writing a press for a university 21 for a society. Um, and one of the easy ways to get them started perhaps is to get them into data computation. Um, because they, they probably don't have data publication happening right now. So by getting them into that and getting them used to open access publishing, it's a way to open the door for um, other types of journals. The other thing we find in the UK is that, um, I'm not sure how similar it is in the United States, but a lot of societies make a lot of money from big publishers. Some of them make half a million, a million a year. I have absolutely no idea how that works. It's obviously at the, at the expense of some of the smaller societies who don't make that money. Um, so what we do is we allow them, uh, because we only charge the $400, we allow them to make an additional charge on top of that. So it might be another $400 or so. So with a, a decent sized journal, they can actually bring in another fifty dollars or $60,000 a year. Um, and that's a way to sort of wean them off the big publishing model. Because most of them, any society wants to be able to access it. It's in their, their mission statement that they will um, disseminate knowledge as widely as possible. Uh, they are kind of held hostage by the, the, these large publishers with these big subscription deals. So we have to find a way to sweeten the end of replacing that money. It's not just down there. Yeah. Yeah. Is, are, is the press produced in just digital projects or uh, products, or do you actually have physical books and that's coming out too? Yeah. Um, well, we're digital first. Um, so, but we have print-on-demand services as well, which we outsource. Um, so, yeah, all of the books we have are available as, as print through Amazon and things like that. But we don't, we don't sort of, we don't have any of this sort of. Um, one of the reasons larger publishers, I think, can't drop their APCs down is because they have a lot of legacy business operations, like they have massive print warehouses. I know some of the, the, the top five publishers are spending, you know, a large part of this year and last year shutting down their warehouses and trying desperately to get away from holding stock. Like that, it's a cost of so much money. So that's a really big advantage if you're starting a, a, a business in publishing right now is you can avoid all of that. But it's still essential. People like it. Everyone wants a copy for their mother. <laughs> Could you describe your offering tool and uh, are offers required to use that tool to submit? Uh, Sure. Um, well, they're not required to. Uh, we offer them uh, templates in, in Word and open document format and things like that. Um, but it's much, much quicker. So it's basically, it's, it's like an online form. Because a data paper is really a, a very highly structured short set of metadata in lots of ways, except for the big reuse paragraph. Um, so it's just a, it's a form where um, they fill it out online very quickly. It has a lot of controlled vocabulary, so if they want to choose a species name, for example, it does a lookup and gives them a list uh, to make sure we can cross-search across papers. They choose the geographical location of their data, they you know, plot points on a map, things like that, to make it quicker. Um, so it's, it's just pretty quick, and then they can save it, and then immediately the, the um, peer reviewers are sent an email saying paper is ready for peer review, and they can log in, and it just speeds things up a lot. So it's only for data publication. Uh, at this stage, it's, it's, I think providing an authoring tool for a, a full paper is a hard problem. And there are, we're probably more interested in working with companies like Authorea, 
so forth, who are out there who are doing a really, really good job with that. Time for a few questions more. Um, seems to me that your um, review process is more geared towards uh, sciences, or life sciences, and humanities. Because um, there are lots of people in humanities or social sciences which might be theoretical or just reflective and wouldn't have all these things about reuse and the you know, mental section. So what do you do about such papers? Uh, well, for research papers, they have different review process. So uh, we do a lot of humanities. So if, if in, in, in research papers themselves, it's exactly the same review process as elsewhere. But for data papers, um, it's, it's much more objective. Like, so a data paper, for example, in historical data or archaeology data is pretty much the same as one in medical data. It has a, a section explaining how the how the data was collected. It's, it has a section talking about um, file types and its reuse potential. It's really the same. Um, data is data across the board. Really. Um, but other types of research, which are theoretical, then have a different type of paper and has a different review process. Well, I think that uh, we should. Thank Brian again.